and principle. All right, so I'm gonna be starting with this. Oh my! <laughs> I don't know. I I really don't like stopping to let people into anything. But all right, so let me just quickly let myself into the meeting. I'm on a different device so I can see the chat and interact with it. I could actually use my actual email. Just see. It's with accepting. All right. So we're starting now. <coughs> Reactions about keys. All right. So before we go into it, before we start the reactions of alkenes, there are some questions that I want to ask. That I tend to normally ask. All right. And that is, what do we already know about the reactions of alkenes so far? Just let me know what do alkenes do. What types of reactions do they participate in? Combustion, addition, reactions, all right. Um, that's an interesting thing that you'd say combustion. I didn't list the combustion reaction on the list. Um, most definitely because we looked at combustion before, so should be fine. Electrophilic addition. All right. So we have a fair amount of reactions that occur within alkenes. Now, first of all, no, the things that we need to cover are the selected chemical reactions of alkenes, which I have, you know, I'm going to go through a few of them that were picked and then explain the steps involved in the mechanism of selected chemical reactions for alkenes. For the alkene functional group, all right, and the alkene functional group is the double bond, as we all know. So we're just going to be looking at the reactions, and we're going to be looking at the mechanisms for those reactions. Simply enough, all right. So the reactions we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at electrophilic addition reactions, such as the, the reactions with hydrogen halides, and the reactions with aqueous bromine specifically. All right. Then we're going to be looking at the reaction of alkenes with concentrated sulfuric acid and then with water right with acid cat with water on under the presence of a acid catalyst right then we're going to be looking at the reaction of alkene with hydrogen which is hydrogenation of alkenes then we're going to be looking at the oxidation of alkenes using hot acidified potassium permanganate and cold acidified potassium permanganate all right so these are all the reactions that we're going to be looking at all of the mechanisms for these reactions, all right? Some of them, some of the mechanisms, for example, the reaction with sulfuric acid, it's something that you don't have to know the mechanism per se, but you just generally have to know what comes up to the reaction, all right? It's just a reaction there, all right? So we're just going to be looking at that reaction kind of. So I'm going to tell you what you specifically most definitely need to know and what you don't really have to focus on, but it's there. All right, so these are the key reactions. We're going to be looking at the major reactions, which are just reactions with acid, all right? Hydrogenation, oxidation, electrophilic addition. All right, so let me just let this person in. All right, so let's just get on board. Are there any questions or concerns before we move on? Any issues though? Okay. Far? All right, no problem. So let's start. Before we get into all of that, we have to understand carbocation stability, right? Um, carbocation stability is something that I think needs to be, I don't, I'm not sure if it's like written in the syllabus, but it needs to be on a specific heading because a lot of these reactions tend to depend on the stability of carbocations, right? What are carbocations, me ask, right? These are just cations that are formed from carbon species. Well, carbocations, right? Now, in this case, all right, we tend to have three different categories of carbocations, right? And their stability depends on, generally, 
the inductive effect, the hyperconjugative effect for certain types of carbocations, but in this case, the inductive effect for these types of carbocations, right? That are just alkyl in nature. So carbocation stability. Does anybody know about this? We've seen this before, yes or no? We spoke about this. Well, not with me, before. but you've seen it before. All right. So it's really simple. So one thing that is present throughout all of organic chemistry is charge, right? Charge distribution. The stability of organic compounds or carbon compounds like this most times depend on the ability for a molecule to distribute charge, right? If charge is concentrated in one place, that means that the species is more unstable than if it were to redistribute charge across a molecule or across itself. So if we have the concentration of one positive charge in one general region, this would be somewhat unstable. But if we're able to redistribute that charge onto smaller regions, right, it would be easier to handle, right? For example, you're walking up a hill, right, carrying, let me say, carrying 20 textbooks in your hand, right? Let's say 10 textbooks in your hand carrying 10 textbooks in your hand, right? And you have a friend with you. It is much more comfortable for, for you to distribute some of those textbooks to that friend as you guys walk up the hill, right? It would be much easier for the collective, right, to redistribute the amount of weight they have to carry, right, than to focus all that weight on one person. So it's a similar thing with charge. In our molecules, we do not want one atom to have concentrated charge. Therefore, we must find a way to redistribute charge. And carbocation stability is one of our examples that we use to really understand the inductive effect and also stability stemming from the redistribution of charge. That was a mouthful. But let's look at it in this case. Primary carbocations, right? Let's start with tertiary, actually. Tertiary carbocations, in a way, as we can see here, I'm going to redraw it because I always scribble when I am explaining. So, tertiary generally means that you have a carbon bonded to three other carbons. All right? That's generally the case. Carbon bonded to three other carbons. That's what a tertiary um, carbocation speaks to. So it, the carbon has to have a positive charge, right, while it's bonded to three other alkyl groups, right? And then the secondary is bonded to two alkyl groups, as we can see here, and primary is bonded to one alkyl group. No alkyl groups, in this case, all right, let me just say it like that, alkyl groups in this case help to redistribute charge, right? So electrons can actually move freely throughout some of the molecular orbitals that are bonded between the alkyl group and the carbon, right? So what will happen here is that if there's a positive charge concentrated on this carbo carbon atom, right, the electrons from the R groups will actually move closer towards the positive carbon in an effort to minimize the charge on the carbon atom, right? And because the carbon atom is positive in this nature, right, the electrons will move towards that positive charge, right, making it just that much more negative, right, in order to dampen the charge on the carbon atom, right? So you're going to have one, two, three electron donating groups. And when we start talking about destabilizing an aromatic ring and stuff like that, we're going to be talking about withdrawing and donating groups, right? But alkyl groups are donating groups. What they'll do is donate some of their electrons towards that positive charge to stabilize the molecule, right? And as we could have probably guessed, the more alkyl groups we have, the more electrons are present to move towards the positive charge and to stabilize the molecule, right? So in the event of a, well, 
when we have a tertiary carbocation, it has three alkyl groups, right? That would donate some amount of electronic charge to dampen that strong centralized positive charge. All right. Everybody following so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, does it make sense though? You may be following, but does it make sense? Mostly. Mostly. Okay. Do we have a question you'd like to ask? Sir, I'm not sure because there was a bit of noise in the background. So, but I understand the latter part. Okay, so where did that that noise come in? Where did you miss me? Before you spoke on the the alkyl groups surrounding the central carbocation. Okay, so what we're saying, you know, these alkyl groups, right? tend to be electron donating groups. What it generally means is that the electrons associated in the, associated in the bonds between these alkyl groups and the carbon that bears the charge, these electrons tend to move towards the positive charge, right? And as I was saying, we don't want any type of centralized charge on any molecule at all. All molecules attempt to reduce the high charge, right? or the high centralized charge in order to gain stability. So these electrons in these bonds will move closer to the carbon, right? As it's it's similar to the carbon becoming more electronegative now because it is positive, but we don't want to save that just yet, right? So it's that the electrons in these bonds start to move towards a positive charge as they are attracted to positive charge. And this tends to reduce the huge centralized charge on the carbon, right? So the more alkyl groups you have to donate electrons, right, the more stable the carbocation. So the tertiary carbocation is the most stable carbocation that can be produced, right? It's more stable than the secondary because the secondary only has two to donate electrons, right? So it's going to be less stable than the tertiary, but still more stable than a methyl um, carbocation. Well, wouldn't say a methyl radical. I'm gonna, that's a little bit different, All right? But you're going to have this primary carbocation here, all right? And then this primary carbocation is going to have that there, only one alkyl group to really reduce the charge. And then in the case that you have just a methyl group like this, you have no um alkyl group to donate so you're just going to have this is highly unlikely right that this really occurs like this for most of the time right but in the case that you have that type of radical spe species right you're going to have something highly reactive like that but what we're basically saying is that we don't want any centralized charge we don't want anything like that right and because carbocations because they're cations they tend to be positive electrons in the bonds tend to move towards that positive charge to diminish that positive charge and the more groups that you have donating electrons to the positive charge the more stable your carbocation intermediate will be make sense yes sir thank you all right wonderful so ones in the chat everybody if everybody understands if there's even one thing that may be rubbing you in the wrong way, let me know. So other than that, just drop a one in the chat to let me know that everything is good so far. All right. Everything seems fine so far. So that's really understanding carbocation stability. So when we're looking at intermediate, these are intermediates, by the way. So when we're looking at intermediates within reactions, right, we tend to say that the most stable intermediate will be produced, right? It's not to say that the least stable intermediate cannot be produced. It's just going to be produced at a lesser percentage. So where you have reactions that can give you one product opposed to the other, right? The product in most abundance will be the one that is formed from the more stable intermediate, right? Because stable species tend to exist. Unstable species tend to exist in lesser quantities, all right? 
It's just something like that. We're gonna see some of them in some reactions, right? Now, going over this, nucleophiles versus electrophiles and stuff like that. Nucleophiles means nucleus loving, right? It loves positive charges. So these are molecules or um, general species, right, whether big or small, that really do like positive charges, right? So they're attracted to that. So it's a reagent that provides a pair of electrons to form a new covalent bond, right? And these are called Lewis bases, right? So where you looked at the Bronsted um, lorry um, definition of acid and bases, and you look at the Arrhenius definition of acid and bases from CSEC to Cape Unit 1. This is looking at bronze, um, Lewis acids and Lewis bases. So, Lewis bases are substances that donate an electron, right? Or a pair of electrons, rather. So, when you look at something like that, right, that is what a nucleophile is. So, let's look at these things, right? So, these Lewis bases or these nucleophiles tend to be species that are electron dense, right, or electron rich, right? For example, the chloride ion is a Lewis base in this sense, right? It is nucleophilic in nature because it's really negative. And since nucleophiles are negative, that's why they like positive charges. That's generally it, all right? That's why they like um, those type of charges. We gen generally denote nucleophiles by NU two electrons and a negative charge, all right? These electrons that you draw around for your Lewis structures, all right? So um, remember the, those type of structures that you have? Those type of structures, you need to write your electrons because how else would you show the movement of a pair of electrons if you don't have a location to get the electrons from? So you need to always have your electrons like that present on the molecule. All right, so that is what a nucleophile is, right? They're usually substances that are electron rich. They all they always tend to have a low, at least one lone pair of electrons to donate, right? As they are Lewis bases, right? And they donate this pair of electrons to form a covalent bond, right? So even when you look at things like coordinate bonding, right, in uh, Unit One Chemistry Module One, right, really really far back, simple stuff, right? You look at the fact that ammonia tends to create a coordinate covalent bond with boron trifluoride. Ammonia is a Lewis base, right? So you could look at something like that. Chloride is a Lewis base, right? And we always saw sodium attaching to the chlorine to create sodium chloride in that sense, right? So it acts in that type of sense. So in this, in this case, it's like a Lewis base, right? While the sodium ion is a Lewis acid. And it will be noted as an electrophile, right? So let's have a look at the electrophiles, right? This is just some more information on how we draw the arrows and stuff like that. We're going to be going through the mechanisms to understand how these things work, right? But this information is for you guys, right? But yeah, so the attractiveness of a species to positive charge, right, is what basicity really is, right? When we talk about acids and bases, it's really movement of electrons sometimes sometimes we characterize it as the evolution of hydroxide or um hydroxide ions in solution etc cetera, etc cetera, right but in the case of organic chemistry we're going to be dealing with lewis bases for the most part right so those are what nucleophiles are in that in that sense for electrophiles though which are lewis acids in nature electro file right they love negative charge right they're electron loving so if they love negative charges right they themselves have to be positive denoted by e plus right so it's generally something like this and you know and the electrophiles tend to be electron deficient species in some cases right in some cases just be aware that I said in some cases right usually they are all right, so you don't tend to be drawn. Go ahead. Is there a question? Electrophiles tend to be what? Um, electron deficient. Oh, okay. I just never heard what you said clearly. Oh, no problem. So they tend to be electron deficient, all right? You, since they're electron deficient, they don't really have lone pairs or anything like that to donate because they are not Lewis bases. They're Lewis acids. 
So what they do is accept, right? So for an electrophile like that, a nucleophile, right, it would actually be attracted to a nucleophile, right, to actually receive the electrons from a nucleophile to form that type of bond, right? So they are electron pair acceptors, right? So that's generally what it is. So we see something like a carbocation. Carbocations are electrophilic in nature, all right, because they have such a concentrated positive charge on one of the carbon atoms, it's begging for a nucleophile. And that's one of the really interesting things that we're going to look up, look at in um, electrophilic attacks and nucleophilic attacks and stuff like that, all right? The same bor um, boron trifluoride that I was discussing a while ago, right? Sulfuric acid, right? And we have aluminum trichloride, right? So these tend to be somewhat electron deficient, right? They tend to have a positive charge or a partially positive charge somewhere on the molecule, right? And that allows for a negative nucleophile to come in and engage in a nucleophilic attack. And when we start talking about regioselectivity and stereochemistry, right, we're going to see that they always attack from the back. So we normally call it a backside attack, right? But let's leave that there for now. When we reach the reactions of the haloalkanes, then we discuss that, right? The SN1 and SN2 reactions. So that is generally, right? So electrophile, nucleophile, everybody's fine with those two terms? Yes, sir. All right. Wonderful. I don't see any questions in the chat. So let's move on. The addition reaction with hydrogen halides, really, really important. All right? So the mechanism by which hydrogen halides react with alkenes is electrophilic addition. All right? So we're going to be discussing this. All right? So first, if we have a hydrogen halide, we're going to be using um, HBr. Or we're going to be using hydrogen bromide. All right? So hydrogen bromide is a polar molecule with a partial charge on partial positive charge on the hydrogen atom and a partially negative charge on the bromine atom right obviously because bromine is more electronegative so the hydrogen bromide acts as an electrophile attacking the area of high electron density in the double bond of ethene we're going to be looking at that an electron pair from the double bond in ethene forms a bond with the hydrogen atom to form a positively charged carbocation intermediate really really important at the same time the bromine atom gains control of the electron pair right from the hydrogen bromide to form a bromine ion right a bromide rather ion and then the hydrogen bromide bond will break heterolytically yet again because one species is more electronegative than the other and then we have the bromide ion then attacks the positive carbocation and the addition product bromoethane is formed right so we have all of that information here what does it even mean right i want you guys to attempt to write the reaction mechanism for the reaction of prop one in and hydrogen chloride by the way so just take that down i want you guys to write that reaction right when you're once you're done with that reaction and if you want to share it with me you can inbox me um on whatsapp and just send me the picture right but I want to see how your mechanisms are written for this type of reaction. And then we move on to the next slide and explore how these mechanisms take, take form. All right. So let's get out a piece of paper. Even if it's only one person draw it, I want that one person to draw it. Have a go at that. So you said propionine and what? Propionine and hydrogen chloride. Okay. I have a mechanism, well, I won't use mechanism. I have a procedure for writing stuff like this, right? Um, I find it as a method that is really helpful. I always write my reaction first. This way, see what is reacting, what are the products, state symbols, everything, balanced, right? And then I do my entire mechanism. So write the reaction, write out the reaction, then write your mechanism to display how you even get those products. Right. So how much time do you guys need for that, though? I don't think you need upwards of two minutes. So let me just put two minutes on the clock. 
So you guys have two minutes beginning now. It doesn't have to be really neat, but our arrows need to be showing the right thing. Arrows only come from electrons and only goes towards electron deficient areas. Half arrow shows movement of one electron, full arrow shows movement of a pair of electrons. Keep that in mind. All right. You have one minute and 30 seconds. Thirty seconds remaining. Make sure that your arrows are correct, your bonds are correct, your product is stoichiometrically in line. Make sure that you don't create any new atoms out of nowhere. All right, ten seconds. So you guys should be finishing up now. So let me just go over to my WhatsApp to make sure that I'm able to see anybody who PM'd me. All right. I don't see any photos yet, so I'm just going to be waiting. All right, is anybody finished? Good this reaction. Just drop a one in the chat if you're complete. And let me know if you've sent me sent me the reaction to look at. All right. Is anyone finished? Not yet. Oh. So it's taking upwards of two minutes. Okay. You know what? Um, when you're done, just let me know when you're done. All right. We're gonna go through the reaction so you guys can fix the mistakes, if any. All right. So. Yeah, I don't think it would be necessary to send me the pictures, right? Because I'm gonna go through it anyways, and then you just fix the issues on your paper. So it should be fine. All right. So. Let me just wait until I see anyone finish because I don't want to just start. I want you guys to work through it. We have 30 minutes left in this session, by the way. Let me just check something. Let me just check something real quick. Oh, oh we don't have that many slides. I can't finish this. Shouldn't take too long. All right. All right, drop a one in the chat now if you're finished. Just remind, just reminding you guys to do that. Just drop a one in the chat when you're finished. So one person is finished. Anybody else attempted? All right, Joel finished. Noella. All right. All right, Noella Ketal. <laughs> All right, um, Devona. All right, so we're gonna be moving on in the sake of interest of time, right? So, yes, look at this, right? So this tends to happen in inert substances, inert solvents, right? In order to make sure we, we know that alkenes, because they have the double bond, are extremely reactive. So this reaction tends to happen in inert solvents, right? Such as the chloroform, right? Stuff like that. Let me move on. So let's look at this reaction. 
right, with this symmetrical alkene, right? Now, was the propionine symmetrical? Oh, that's an actual question, by the way. No, sir. No, it wasn't. It was asymmetrical. All right. So we're going to look at what happens to the asymmetrical alkenes, right? But with symmetrical alkenes, all alkenes generally undergo these reactions, right? And when they're symmetrical, right, nothing really matters in this, in this sense, right? What we're going to be having is having the alkene, ethene here, right, and the hydrogen chloride. Hold on, I think a good amount of persons are okay. All right, so we're gonna have this with hydrogen chloride, and we're just going to be ended, ending up with a alkene, right? A chloroalkene. And then here we have two, right? So butuene here, and then we have hydrogen chloride, and then we're just gonna have the chlorine added to either one of these carbons here, all right? So step one, butuene takes the role of a nucleophile. Why? Anybody can explain to me why butuene takes the role of a nucleophile? Why is it so? Butuene, let me draw it a little bit better. Butuene, why is it a nucleophile? Or why is it nucleophilic? It has, a, Go ahead. it has an electron density or a high electron density because of the two bonds. Because of the double bonds. Wonderful. All right. So we know generally from unit one chemistry that when you have SP, um, SP, SP overlap, and then you have a unhybridized P orbitals creating that double bond, we tend to have a high electron density system. Our high electron dense system. All right, so double bonds, there are more electrons in double bonds than in single bonds. All right, I know it's a revel revelation, all right? But in this case, we have one, we have four electrons existing in this region as opposed to in these regions, the other regions on the molecule where you only have two, all right? So in this region, we have generally four electrons. In this region, we have two electrons. In this region, we have two electrons, right? So that four electron region is going to be electron dense, right? And that's why it's going to have all that negative charge built up there. So it's going to be a nucleophilic in nature, right? Then the electrophilic hydrogen accepts electrons, right? While the chlorine accepts electrons and acts like a leaving group, right? So hydrogen chloride here, chlorine is way more electronegative than hydrogen. Right? Therefore, the electrons in the bond are going to be moving closer to the chlorine, making sure that the chlorine has a, a partial negative charge, hydrogen has a partial positive charge. And systems or atoms or species that are partially positive will be electrophilic in nature. So what we will notice now is that this polar molecule, when it comes in contact to a high electron dense system, such as a double bond, right, the electrons will move, right, towards hydrogen, right, we're going to have that type of electrophilic attack, right, so in which a positive hydrogen attracts electrons from the double bond, right, and then these, as the electrons come in, the electrons from the bond go towards the more negative species right or the more electronegative species and this occurs well this allows right heterolytic cleavage to occur all right so everything's fine there is everything fine here any questions any issues with this no questions wonderful all right, so we're going to have that happening, right? So once the hydrogen comes into contact with the, with the double bond here, right, it's going to be attracting that, right? And when the electrons are coming in, it's going to be pushing the electrons in this bond, right, onto the chlorine. Because as the hydrogen leaves the chlor chlorine, right, the electrons are going to want to prefer 
to stay with the chlorine as it's more electronegative while the hydrogen leaves, right? So it's something like that. The hydrogen is going and chlorine is keeping the electrons as the bond breaks, which is heterolytic cleavage, right? Then after it cleaves like that, right, we're going to have the creation of a carbocation intermediate. Oh, does that make sense? Let me create a blank slide and show that. Even though diagrams and stuff like that on the slides, I think it makes a little bit more sense if I just go through it like this, right? So, as we said, first step, electron dense area, we're going to have partial negative, partial positive, right? Electrons are going to be attracted to the hydrogen specifically, right? And the electrons in the bond, both of them are going towards the partially negative chlorine. Notice I'm using full heads. That means that pairs of electrons are moving, right? After that, no. What we're going to end up with is a species like this, right? That has a positive charge here, all right? The chlorine is going to exist as a chloride radical, all right? So it's going to be, well, not a radical, sorry, a chloride ion, right? And then the electrons, no. We generally just look at one lone pair, right? So you could write it like this, but we generally just put one lone pair. So from the lone pair, the lone pair of electrons are attracted to that positive charge, all right, to actually just stabilize that molecule. And what we're going to have, have happening in the end is something that looks like this. Everything like that is fair? Any questions or concerns? Sir, can you go over that again, please? Sorry. All right, let me go over that again. All right, so I'm not leaving until it's understood by everybody. All right, so wonderful. We have that electron dense area there, right? Nicholas, follow it. Yes, sir. Right. No, is electron dense because? Because? Uh, because of the double bond. Or... The double bond contains more electrons in this specific area on the molecule than anywhere else, right? Um, if it is oh, yeah, a skeletal, yeah. All right. If it's a skeletal. Um, formally, are the skeletal structures messing anybody up? Just let me know. But I'm using it so everybody can get used to it. All right, so we're going to have this molecule. We're using hydrogen chloride. That is what we're using. All right, now hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule as chlorine is more electronegative. Therefore, electrons in the bond will move closer to the chlorine and create a slightly negative and a slightly positive charge here. Make sense? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, so when they when it interacts with this molecule, now when they interact with each other, what we're going to have is a electrophilic attack, right? So it's an electrophilic attack. So we're gonna have electrons coming from the electron dense area on the butene, right, going towards this electrophile, right, and that interaction causes a cleavage, right? So what's going to happen now is that the hydrogen is going to be added to the structure of the alkene, right? And when this bond breaks, right, this hydrogen chloride bond breaks, because chlorine is more electronegative, it will receive both electrons. And this is heterolytic cleavage. Following? Yes, sir. You sure? Yes, sir. I guess I know. I just wasn't paying attention, I guess. Okay. So that's fine. So we have that there. What's going to happen next now? We're going to have a structure like this. All right. So we're going to have the hydrogen, the new hydrogen that we have is added. For example, let's say it's added here. All right. That means that there's going to be a carbocation intermediate being formed there. Can you see it? Hoping that everybody could see it from that way. All right, what's basically happening here is that we have this butene molecule. Sorry. 
Just showing the structure of this molecule. This is our new hydrogen, right? And then we have nothing bonded here. So this is that positive charge that we're seeing there. All right, so they are the same thing. All right, so we have that positive charge there. So after the, the heterolytic cleavage, we're going to have the chloride there existing in space. It's negative, right? It is a nucleophile, and we're going to have high positive charge here. So we're going to have a nucleophilic attack in which a nucleophile will be attracted towards that positive charge there, all right? And that will result in this molecule. Let me, let me make it a little bit more, yeah. All right. So that's clear. That's clear. Yeah, clear, sir. All right. So that's what electrophilic addition is, right? First of all, it's an alkene. It's going to form an alkene on something. It's going to form an alkene, right? It's going to have only have double bond, um, single bonds, rather, after, right? So you're adding stuff to it. You're not substituting anything. So it's generally just an addition reaction, right? Why we call it an electrophilic addition is because an electrophile is added first. And the first thing to be added to the substance is the electrophile of that that proton that comes off, right? Will be the electrophile. So that's what happens in symmetrical alkenes, right? Because it doesn't matter where it adds across the double bond, the substance is symmetrical. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Matters not, right? Because if you look at it like this, right? Um can I erase what's happening here? Samira, I saw your comment. So can I erase what's on the screen to explain why it doesn't matter? All right. Um, not that responsive. Okay, so let me create. Okay, let me just do it here. All right. So why it doesn't matter is because if we have butene, right, butene can form two different radicals, right? Either it can form a radical like this or a radical like this, right? So, well, not a radical, actually, a carbocation, rather, right? So... It's either you will have a positive charge here or a positive charge here. And it doesn't matter where you add it because whether or not, wherever you add the chlorine, right, it will always be the second carbon because of how we really add the molecules, how we really name the molecules, right? So whether or not the chlorine adds to, the, to this carbon on this end or this carbon on this end, it will still be the same molecule fundamentally, all right? So it would not matter at all. The only way it would matter is if we deal with asymmetric, all right, alkenes. And in alkene asymmetry, we know that the double bond, right, is off place, all right? Meaning that the double bond isn't in the exact middle of the compound, all right? It's not in the exact middle of the compound. So in cases where we have that, we're going to have orientation problems. We're going to have issues with where the halogen and where the hydrogen places on the double bonds, right? Can somebody name this, please? Just quickly name that. Longest carbon chain, substituents, location, it's an alkene. So name it, please. somebody to just name that all right so we have the longest carbon chain one two three four five all right so that's a carbon chain so you can see everything else gabriel what's the name of this molecule uh um, two three dimethyl 
Uh, isn't it? Two, three. Okay. So you're adding it from here. One, two, three, four, five. So yeah. you have two, three, dime file, yeah. right? You said pent two in? Okay, pent so in. two, three, dime file, pent two in. All right. So that's the asymmetric molecule that we have there. But asymmetric molecules, we're going to have to look at Markovnikov's rule, right? In order to really attach these things. Now, if hydrogen chloride adds to an unsymmetrical alkene like propene, right, as we were looking at before, there are two possible ways it could add. However, in practice, there is only one major product according to Markovnikov's rule, right? So there are two products. There's, so if you look at propene, just three, there's one product in which the chlorine is going to be added to the last carbon, and there's another product in which the, pro, the chlorine is going to be added to the second carbon, or, or the middle carbon in this case, right? What Markovnikov rule really states is that the hydrogen halide, right, is added... Well, when it's added to an unsymmetrical alkene, the hydrogen becomes attached to the carbon with the most hydrogens attached to it already. All right? So that's what we're going to be looking at. So the hydrogen attaches to the carbon mm. with the most. So let's have a look at that. Let me provide another screen. What was the initial problem before? Could somebody just remind me of the reaction that we were looking at before? That I asked you guys to do? What was the, addi the addition reaction? The one, uh, I think it was pent one in, uh, no, it was pro, propanine pro and HCl. Okay, so propanine and HCl, all right? So if we have prop one in, I mean, it has to be one. All right, so we have propanine. Mm, that's wrong major major issue that almost committed a cardinal sin all right so we have that there 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 proponine right looks fine all right we're adding it with hcl so we understand how this is going to happen already all right we have the h we have the cl more electronegative partially negative partially positive electrophilic attack right Heterolytic cleavage, store finish. That is the first move, right? Understand that that is going to be happening, right? No, Markovnikov's rule states that the hydrogen will attach to the carbon with the most hydrogens attached. And which carbon would that be? Carbon one, two, or three? One. Okay. Um. So Markovnikov addition, that's what we're doing. Yeah, Markovnikov addition, right? So it's going to be attaching to carbon one. So let's redraw the molecule in this fashion. And I want everybody to see how we derive Markovnikov's rule, right? Or why is it done like this, right? So if we add it like that now, what we're going to be having formed we're going to be having a carbocation formed, right? What type of carbocation is this? What type of carbocation? Secondary, right? So it has two alkyl groups, right? So we're going to have that. And then what we're going to have is the chlorine left over. Right, we're gonna have that having addition there, or we're gonna end up with uh, this molecule. All right, but what happens when we don't follow that? All right, when we don't follow that, we have anti Markovnikov addition, all right, in which we would actually have let me just use this model then, all right, a carbocation forming here, all right and not in the center, right? So the general issue is that if you have something like a carbocation forming 
at the end of a molecule, this is a primary carbocation versus a secondary carbocation, right? So what Markovnikov's rule states is that you want to add the, add the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogen, right? So that the most stable intermediate can be formed. Because if we form a primary carbocation, that, won't, that would be our minor product. And if we have a more stable one, that, that would be our major product. So in the case of propene reacting with uh, the hydrogen chloride, our major product would be what? After we do the entire addition, what would be our major product be? Propene, propanein, plus HCl, our major product would be what? Nobody has any idea what the major product would be? Uh, fluoro one. Yeah, it would be the whichever carbon it went to, and it'd be chloromethane, right? No, chloropropane. Chloropropane, right? So the major product, right, would be actually two, right? So the major product would be this, right? And the minor product would be this. Well, it wouldn't be that, actually. It would be this. Make sense? Hopefully, everybody can understand skeletal structure. All right? So that's what's happening, right? So the major product would be two chloropropane, right? And the minor product would just be one chloropropane. Okay, I think there's a question. Go ahead. So, sir, Markovnikov's rule is not really a rule. It's more like a guideline because there's always a chance that it won't be followed. Or I'm not understanding it. Um, okay, the Markovnikov rule, right, is for the formation of the major product, right? So, it's a rule of how you get the major product, right? And, yeah, it doesn't have to be followed all the time. It's not always followed, right? And that's where you get anti-Markovnikov products, which is the minor product. So the Markovnikov product is a major product. Anti-Markovnikov product is a minor product. So it's generally that. Yeah, so it's kind of a guideline in a sense. Sure. So remember, the most stable intermediate, whatever product is formed from the most stable intermediate will be the major product. All right? So that's what we're going to be having there. So what would be the Markovnikov product for this reaction? Right? So give me the major product and the minor product and what would be the Markovnikov product. Notice that this question, nowhere did it say to write a mechanism. All right? So just tell me the products. What's the major product? What's the minor product? You can put it in the chat. Or if you want to unmute and tell me, you can. So the major product Samira is saying is 2-chloropentane. Same thing Gabriel has. Ooh, Gabriel, you have to change that E into an A, you know. All right, we're going to have an alkane after. Wonderful. All right. So we're saying that the major product will be 2. So we're going to have for the major product would be here. All right. That would be the major product. And for the minor product? Gonna have that. Just chloropentane. One chloropentane. To be specific. Alright? But it's located at the end of the chain. Alright? So, and we understand why. Alright? Because the one formed from here is more stable than the one formed from here. All right, so the secondary carbocation is way more stable than primary carbocation. 
And the same way, if we had a tertiary carbocation, that would be the major product over the secondary carbocation. All right. So that is what I have for you there. All right. So the reaction of alkenes with bromine now. So let's say that there is no polarity on the molecule. The molecule is generally nonpolar in this case now. All right. And we have to add something like a molecular halogen to a alkene, all right? The case in point, I want you guys to write the reaction mechanism for the reaction between butuene and chlorine, all right? I don't think, we're going to go a bit over time, but I don't think you guys have to um, complete it in this session. I just want you to note that though, so you can practice it and you can ask me questions after, all right? So I want you to practice that. So let's look at what happens when we're dealing with something that is not polar, all right? What happens to the substance is not polar. Let me create a page and let's get to work. Now, let me use ethene, simplest, all right? Plus BRBR. -BR. Now, can somebody explain to me how this going to react if there is no apparent electrophile? How is this going to react? Anybody can guess? All right, so let me see what Mr. Edmund has. So it's going to split homolytically. Ah, all right. But, you know, you say it's going to split homolytically, you know. Well, if it's split homolytically, you know, we're going to have creations of radicals. Um, I'm not sure where to go there because we're using electrophilic addition and not free radical substitution, right? So, kind of going a little bit off there. Because free radicals have unpaired electrons, you know, so why is it going to be attracted to electron dense area? All right. So not really like that. All right, Mr. Edmund. All right, so Elaine has a double bond will break. It's okay. So we are aware of intermolecular interactions, all right? This is one of the reasons why UD1 comes before UD2, you know. We are aware of intermolecular interactions. And we must be aware of opposite, well, same charges, rep repulsion interactions between two molecules, right? Two electron dense areas will start repelling each other. So what happens here, you know, let's say that the bromine comes in close contact with that double bond. This double bond is a highly electron dense area, right? More so electron dense, right? And what's happening on the bromine specifically. So the interaction, right? will actually cause electrons to move towards this bromine molecule, right? This is a simple interaction. I'm not sure who can name it for me at the moment. Can anybody name the type of interaction we're discussing here? Intermolecular interactions from London dispersion forces. Anybody can let me know what it's similar to? about that trying to get this painted all right anybody can let me know what it's about what's happening for this reaction or this interaction you guys can at least try you know <laughs> sir could i ask you a question again because i heard like two different questions okay so what is the name of this interaction, this intermolecular interaction we're discussing? Oh, um, is it Van der Waal forces? Well, it is the result of a Van der Waal force. That is true. Sir, is it, would it be that an instantaneous dipole would be formed? Wonderful. <laughs> Induced dipole, all right? So an instantaneous dipole will be formed, all right? 
whoever that person is, they just, I don't know, they, okay, 50 respect points. Um, so, instantaneous dipole, all right? But it is a vulnerable force as well. It's a London version force, all right? So, what's going to happen is that the electronic area here is going to have some type of interaction, all right? Let me just draw a dotted line to show intermolecular interaction, um, interactions, all right? And that will create an instantaneous dipole on the, the halide, all right? are on the halogen bond, right? The halogen molecule. So we're going to have electrons being pushed from the bromine, right, towards the other one. And we're going to have heterolytic cleavage here, right, as this one becomes slightly negative and this one becomes slightly positive, and then we have an electrophile. All right? It looks kind of weird, but it does happen, <laughs> right? I think it would be probably, it would probably be the last thing you'd think about. How can a halogen have a slightly positive charge? This is ludicrous. Um, but it does happen, right? So we're going to have something like this happening, right? And then after that, we're going to have the creation of a carbocation, right? Carbocation. Hyd oh, we don't have any hydrogen adding. Sorry about that. We have the bromine added there, and then we're going to have a carbocation, and there's only another bromine there, right, to be added to that positive charge, right? And then you're going to be ending up with something like this. All right, that is it. Everybody's fine with that so far? Everybody's clear? Yes, sir. All right. That's induced dipole. Instantaneous dipole is formed, right? So that is it. Forces of attraction causes this one, all right? And not just the fact that the molecule is polar. All right, so we have that there. And Markovnikov's rule doesn't really apply in this situation give me a second i think i is there a question i heard a notification so oh i was asking you for the partially positive and partially negative there's no explanation for it we should just work with it or would it just miss it on a whole because i don't understand how that happened. the partial okay so an instantaneous dipole is formed right so when the bromine molecule comes close enough to the double bond on the alkene on the alkene rather right we're going to have the the electrons in the double bond interacting with the electrons on the bromine atom that is closest to it right and those electrons in the double bond will push right that's what this arrow is drawing right somewhat pushing the electrons from that bromine atom onto the other bromine atom creating a slightly positive force on the first one and a slightly negative force on the other one. So it's about instantaneous dipoles. All right? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds really unsure. Um, that sounds really unsure. Um, if you want me to explain it in a little bit more depth, I can do it after this session. All right? So I'll explain to you in a little bit more depth how this happens. All right? With a module with a unit one um, PowerPoint, all right, just a one page by the way. But this is what happens here. So how do we know that the thing is an alkene, all right? Liquid bromine is very very hazardous, but that is what we use to determine whether or not something is an alkene. Therefore, aqueous bromine, bromine water is used, right, in the carbon carbon double bond testing alkenes. So compounds containing double bonds are also described as unsaturated compounds. So the test for this, right, is a test for, un well, the, set, the test we use to, to look at, you know, alkenes are the test for unsaturated compounds. So what we'll do, we add bromine water, which is orangish colored, deep brown, reddish brown, into the solution, right? And if it reacts, if it reacts, what happens? If the, if the color remains, that means that bromine is present, right? Nothing really happened. Bromine is present. The the the, al the alkyl species, right, is saturated, right? 
it's not really adding the bromine to its structure. But if it's reacted and then the bromine water's color disappears, then it is an alkene or has double bonds. It could be an alkene with multiple bonds, right? So it's something like that. So if we react bromine water, right, with a saturated compound, there's not going to be any type of substitution. It's going to remain that color. If we add it to an alkene, then there's going to be our electrophilic addition, removing bromine from the solution, making it, you know, making the color disappear, all right? So that's, that's what's happening here. Everybody understands this, right? I think it has been seen in CSEC. So everybody understands this? Everybody gets where I'm coming from, yeah? Okay. Everything should be fine here. All right, okay. so the reactions of alkenes with concentrated sulfuric acid is an addition reaction, all right? This is one of the things that we don't really have to know the mechanism per se, but it is there. So a simple addition reaction, all right? The mechanism is here as well, all right? So it will produce alcohol, a primary alcohol, right? With propanol. So it's just one of the things that I want you guys to have an understanding of. So when alkenes react with acids, right, in vit or water, right, water in um acidic medium, right, they tend to produce alcohols. Right? So that's generally it for this. We don't we're not going to go through the mechanism. The mechanism is not important for you at this moment in Cape, right? But I still place the mechanism there. Just to know that you know you guys get an alcohol at the end, right? So that is that. That's all that that is there for. Right? Hydrogenation. I think we understand hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is the addition of hydrogen, right, to an unsaturated compound to make it saturated. And this must happen at a relatively high temperature with the presence of a nickel catalyst. Right? The example is ethene reacting with hydrogen gas in the presence of this nickel catalyst at 150 degrees Celsius to provide ethane. Right? So this is the reduction of our alkenes. Right? Reduction, the addition of hydrogen is reduction, as we know. Right? So we have this reaction here. Everybody's fine with this? Just drop a one in the chat if we're ready to move on. Why I'm moving so far quickly across these? Because it's expected that you guys already have a solid understanding of this. All right? From section E of the CSEC syllabus. But if there are questions, ask same way. No? Not because you're kind of supposed to know. All right? If you have a question, ask the question. All right? So everybody seems that they're seems like they're fine. I don't hear any issues. Okay. So the main issue, main thing here now, hydrogenation reactions are used to change vegetable oils to margarine, right? So applications in chemistry is important. So for example, chiffon mar margarine, right? This is not butter, right? Right, so half of the entire Caribbean, I plea with you, it is not butter, right? Butter is animal-based, margarine is plant-based. We take vegetable, vegetable oils, right? Put them into vats, hydrogenate them in the presence of a nickel catalyst and produce margarine. It is not butter. All right. So it makes the oils and fats less liquid so that they spread better, right? Or have better um spreading qualities generally, right? Fatty acids which are released when fats are digested may be unsaturated. Right? So sometimes, you know, fatty acids can be there. We take them off, we take the solid product that is remaining, right? And we put them on your shelves, all right, in supermarkets. Hydrogenation also produces trans fats, right? So trans fatty acids. So you guys already went through isomerism. We know cis um, isomers and trans isomers. So hydrogenation also creates trans fats, all right? These are commonly found in nature. So trans fats are used in making pies and pastries, and trans fats are harmful to human health, all right? So they increase the levels of cholesterol in the body leading to heart disease because we know if cholesterol builds up within the blood vessels we're going to have arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis and you guys do cape biology so i don't have to go any further all right but trans fats are one of the things that assist you know in the persistence of heart disease within the caribbean which is a really really issue all right for persons doing food and nutrition you know that that is a high um endemic disease in the caribbean all right because we tend to you know 
um, consume a lot of foods that have trans fats in it, right? Sometimes we can't help ourselves because cheaper options tend to have more harmful chemicals in them, right? So this is it, right? That is that for that. I'm not sure if anybody has any questions about that though. Any questions about hydrogenation? Or the applications of hydrogenation? No? All right. So the reactions of alkenes with cold acidified potassium permanganate, the oxidation. So cold acidified dilute potassium permanganate. This is an oxidation reaction. All right. And we know that potassium permanganate is purple. So the purple solution turns colorless when reacted with the alkene with the abrone precipitate. All right. So abrone precipitate kind of, you know, comes up as well. So the alkene is converted to a diol. Right. And remember, when you're studying on those type of things, please write your reaction, what type of reaction it is, write the color change, and write the products, write the conditions. These are things that are necessary. Name of reaction, type of reaction, color change, conditions, and products. Five things that you must know about every single reaction in the entire syllabus. Just saying. All right? So that's why I put them in slides like this. You just get all the information at one time. All right? So it does create diols, right? And the reaction can be used to test to see if a compound is unsaturated. So if we add cold acidified potassium permanganate to ethene, right? We know that it's acidified. We know it's potassium permanganate. Fine, fair enough, right? An oxidizing agent. We're going to get ethane 1,2 diol, right? As we produce diols, as explained, all right? So that is the reaction here for cold acidified potassium permanganate. But what if we make it hot? Hot acidified concentrated potassium permanganate, right, creates a different type of product, right? So the carbon to carbon double bond in the alkene is broken and a diol is formed, right? Same diol. But due to the high heat and kinetics of the reaction, the diol is in immediately broken down and oxidized into ketones and aldehydes, right? And then further into carboxylic acids and carbon dioxide and water, depending on the alkene. So a mixture of products is formed. So you can create diols, ketones, aldehydes, carboxylic acids, carbon, di carbon dioxide, and water from the oxidation of an alkene with a hot acidified potassium mm. permanganate. All right? I realize that there is a typo here, HOT. All right, so this diagram shows it. So we have as, um, hot, hot acidified potassium permanganate here. The delta shows heat, right? So you can create ketones and aldehydes. Aldehydes tend to remain like that, right? So we can actually move from ketones and aldehydes to create acids, right? So usually the aldehyde would be the one that becomes the acid and the ketone remains stable, right? And then we have the acid being broken down to carbon dioxide and water upon more oxidation, right? So the oxidation of alkenes can give us ketones and aldehydes, but if we continue to put them under this high temperature, right, in this highly oxidative environment, the aldehydes will create acids and then the acids will further break down to give us some amount of carbon dioxide and water. Really, really important, right? Ketones are fairly stable, therefore, ketones will remain in the solution, right? But ketones are really volatile, so they will evaporate, right? Are there any questions here? It's a lot of information, but that's why I made it diagrammatic and put all information in one small paragraph. So, any issues? Any questions? Any concerns? And emotional outbursts. All right. So let's look at it like this, right? So we have a small summary here for all of the information that we generally just went through, right? But I want you guys to understand this specifically. All right. So we have something called reflux that we're going to be looking at in the reactions of alcohols, by the way, all right? But we're going to leave that for when we talk about the oxidation of alcohols and talk about reflux and thing and those reactions that occur under reflux, right? Because the only way, the best way to get aldehydes, right? Um, well, 
carboxylic acids from the oxidation of alkenes is to do it under reflux. So we're going to talk about that in the next session, all right? So that's basically it. Just drop ones in the chat if you're fine with the oxidation of alkenes. Any issues, any concerns? My apologies for going over time, but issues or concerns, no. There are a lot of reasons here. Can you demonstrate using an example? You see, because, okay, <laughs> you see, because um, the mechanisms are not, you know, required. That's why I put just, like, this example, right? And, like, put these examples, right? But you want to see an actual alcohol and how it does that? That's what you want to see? Let me check the chat to see. So you want to demonstrate using an example with, okay. So let me use a mechanism, right? Just to be sh sure, just reminding you guys, you do not need to know the mechanism, but if you want to know the method to the madness, sure. All right, let me revamp my brain for the memorizing this. I think it looks like an ozone analysis. So I'm gonna use it, all right? So alkene. All right, I'm writing a bit too big because this structure and complex is going to get a little bit out of hand. All right, so ethene, all right, we're going to be oxidizing it, all right? So in the presence of an oxidizing agent, oxidizing agents tend to have, you know, um, large availability of oxygen, right? Because, you know, oxidizing agents are required for, you know, you to add oxygen to something, right? So let me use what the things that we normally use is like ozomate, right? So ozomate is a type of structure used with um, osmium, right? Oxides, right? So ozomate ester I'm going to use, right? As I said, you don't need to know this, but somebody asked for an understanding. So ozomate is what we tend to use, right? So for the mechanism per se, I could use permanganate, but... Mm, do I like permanganate? Not really. So we're going to have a complex like this being created, right? Bonds here are going to be cleaved, right here. So we're going to have that type of bond formation here, though, right, at first. Let me not show the cleavage of these yet. Let me just leave it like that first. So we're going to have a complex like that being created, right? We're going to have the movement of the electron from this bond, right? And then the electrons are going to be passing through the molecules like this to produce a ketone. Let me just put an R group here. And we're going to get the production of another unstable species here. All right? So this unstable species here will react again, right? with something like an ozone molecule to produce all the aldehydes and ketones. But it doesn't, it's not really called for, but I feel a bit lazy. I don't think I'm going to confuse this reaction. But it does require a lot of work, right? Because after you do that, you're going to need an oxidative workup and all mm. sorts of type of organic chemistry, right? That is not generally required. But yeah, not going to really go there this evening but yeah are there any issues or concerns though all right so before you guys go just reminding you guys that i want you guys to try to write the reaction mechanism for butene and chlorine right the chlorine molecule as well as i have a surprise for you guys a question for the road for next week, right? Wonderful. As you guys already know, my questions are not completely mandatory. If you want to try, you try. So here we have a branched chain hydrocarbon labeled A that contains 14.2% of hydrogen by mass. A reacts with hydrogen bromide solution to produce two compounds, B and C. In the presence of a palladium catalyst, 
A reacts with hydrogen to produce a gaseous compound D. A has a relative molecular mass of 56. So we must have the empirical formula of A, and hence we must gather its molecular formula. Then we must suggest the functional group presenting A and give a reason for that suggestion. Explain the mechanism involved with the production of B and C, respectively, using arrows to show the movement of electrons and state the name of the reaction mechanism. Then, with reference to C, suggest which of these compounds would be preferentially formed. And then after, write the name and displayed formula of compound D. Doable, right? How do you guys feel about this question? Could you guys do this question? On a scale of 1 to 5, 5 being the highest. How would you do at this question? All right. 4. All right. This question, though, seems so bad. 